What's up guys, my name is Khan and we're back today with more Railroads Online. How's it going Heist? I see you've got some uh, products loaded. This is wonderful. Some wood. Yep, some products loaded. I'm yeah. doing well, but um, yeah, we've got six cars of beams loaded and two blanks up the front. Yeah. It's that time, you know, we... we we're out of we wood. tried to we're shy away from it last time, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna go tackle the ten percent, uh, and it's gonna be idiotic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're gonna go to the coal mine. It's gonna be great. Uh, we're out of wood. We're actually the logging camp is or the sawmill we is out of wood. We finally used all the logs. Well, yeah, we could actually fill this with logs again, which I might do to make some more money in my spare time, because like. That's it's, probably smart and not that exciting to film. So, it's not yeah. a yeah, it's not a very exciting trip to run logs back and forth over and over again, and but it'll just make me a bunch of money for free. So that's kind of it'll probably take like three or four trips to fill the pond anyway. So that's you know I'm at eighteen hundred dollars. We're trying to get one of those gear engines for more stuff. So exactly. please don't do what I did last episode and bin it by going too fast. I really don't want to <laughs> rerail. Yeah, we'd like to early. not rail stuff today, so I'm gonna yeah. try and keep with it. So, like, once we're on the ten percent, by all means, give her a hundred percent. I guess a little disclaimer: I also went to the coal mine, and on the path to the coal mine where we had the head shunt, I put a complete uh, runaround track, as Heist suggested, so that we can bring up the train in multiple parts and then reassemble it, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because right. if, if you go to double the hill, you have to have a place to dump the cars. Right. That's kind of convenient and then run back. And it go is get still more. a fair amount of ways away from the hill, unfortunately, because like you have to get to a spot that's flat. So I finally found a spot that's like reasonably flat where we can, you know, dump cars on a zero percent uh, and then it immediately goes back to three. So it's a little a little rough, but it is what it is. It's going to work and, and it's going to make yeah. it possible because I've, I've done a little bit of math here. Um, let me grab my spreadsheet here. Our total train weight with six loads of lumber and two loads of rails is 166,000 pounds. Okay. Just the loads behind us. And our train, which we are planning to do the Glenbrook, the Class 48, and the Betsy, surprise, uh, is only good for 72,600 so it's triple the 10%. So we're going to have to triple the hill. What's Betsy on her own? Betsy on her own's good for 11,600 just about. Oh, so that's 10%. actually that's actually worth it to have it on then. That's not It's I was... actually doing something. That's that's the funny yeah. thing. It's worth more than the Glenbrook is. I my thought like, was like we're tripling it for 210,000 total ish pulling pounds. Right. And so like I thought maybe we'd have the room to pull Betsy off and still make it, but which we theoretically would, but it'd be close. Yeah, it would be it would be pretty close and, and it wouldn't be ideal, but yeah. it would be fun to have little Betsy uh, feel useful again because it's it's interesting how much tender weight plays into a factor as dead weight when you're talking about a steeper grade like that. Right. Ten like percent, you know. Um, the engines oh, guess... that don't have tenders are significantly better at pulling on those hills. Uh, how is this gonna work? You're gonna back. We're gonna back smelter. in. We're gonna we're just gonna back all the way in with this engine. Load we're it. Gonna load the uh, the rails on. And just drive out straight. And Betsy will come out in front. Betsy will come out in front. Um, Wait, is this gonna be we'll... helper Betsy and then this, or should we like we should put Betsy in front of the helper? Betsy right. should be in front of the helper, so we'll have to. Split you don't want to pull through Betsy and just station. rip it in half and like lift it right up off the rails and. We, we ideally no. Ideally, we don't want to kill poor Betsy, but yeah, we're gonna need Betsy on the on the head end of this whole mess. All right, all right, I'll go. So um, for, for context, we're not bringing the Montezuma because the Montezuma is only good for 2,100 pounds. Yeah, Yes, it's got more tractive effort than the Betsy, but no, the tender like, weighs No, and we'd like so to point much. out that's 2,100 pounds on straight, flat, perfectly uphill 10%, but we have corners, and corners add friction, which means the math goes different, and I don't, we don't have that math, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not going to go great. No, <laughs> it really is not gonna like Montezuma is gonna probably add more trouble than it's worth. So we're gonna, we're gonna Glenbrook is good for ninety seven hundred pounds by itself. Betsy's good for eleven thousand six hundred, and then the class forty eight is good for fifty one thousand four hundred. Yeah, so the class right. forty eight is gonna be doing the meat of the pull in here. Uh, okay, so you're good. You'll get into the um, the off the main line where you're currently switched once you get down here. I'm just doing some smelter stuff, okay. and then uh, I need to have this one. Fire, like fire this up way. Betsy while you're at it. Oh, true. Betsy's out of wood, 
Oh, we have a wood. That's right. We have a wood depot here. We that have is, the technology. We have cut down trees. I love how we have this wood depot and we have the line to resupply it. But then we haven't had to resupply it yet. Thank God. But they come, eventually... They come with like 400 pieces of wood, I think, don't they? Right. But like when we have to resupply it, I guess we'll just do it with one of the cordwood trains. Like bring in the cordwood and just drop it. Use a car or two to... Yeah. Um, that'll be a sad day and we have to use cordwood for you that. Know, you know what we should do? We should get another cordwood car and every time we bring it down, we should drop one car off at oh, it. Oh, have because... a tenth. Because that way you're always loading two because you're wasting time by only loading one at the logging camp. That's true. That's true. We could drop the tenth. Yeah, I mean, that won't, it won't matter car. yet. It, it's only really when we actually burn this pile down. I may or may not have driven through the engine shed doors with Betsy. It's fine. Uh, it didn't render on my end, so oh, as far as I could tell, there, yeah, there no, were no nothing doors bad happened at all. It, so. it's like it's, it's like one time it was interesting when I was when I was first learning to drive as a kid. Um, you know, in, in Canada, you can drive at the age of uh, sixteen with your with your what's called your G one license, at least in Ontario, and it basically is like you can drive with someone else who's fully licensed. It's like a learner's permit, right? Okay. And then you go from your G1 after eight months if you take driver's education or a year if you don't, then you can go and get your G2. And so you can have your G2, which allows you to drive alone, but then you have certain restrictions like you can't drive late at night with more than one person in your car, etc., etc. all this nonsense, right? So there's some restrictions, right? You can't drive on the highways, you can't feed the gremlins after midnight, you know, that kind of thing. All, all that fun stuff. Yeah, all that fun stuff. So that's your G2. But then you can get, so basically at the age of like 16 and a half, you're driving alone, right? So my, my parents had, um, they had a, a, an extra car, so they had... Uh, you know, a regular car. I don't remember what it was, but they also had this like big Chevy Astro van. And the reason why is because my parents used to take us camping and they had this like, not like a huge camping trailer, but they had like one of those like pop-up tent trailer type deals, you know? And so it's heavy enough that you needed this, this van to tow it. Plus, you know, put the kids in the van and all that stuff. Right? So that was the car that we got to drive if we wanted to go somewhere on our own. We could borrow this car. Don't worry, the story is all going somewhere. It's all related to engine sheds, I promise. Anyway. <laughs> so I'm driving this car, and it was kind of like my dad had this policy where it's like, if you want to drive the car, then I'll, uh, I'll put you on the insurance. You have to pay me for the insurance, and you have to pay me for the gas, right? And it's like, okay, that makes sense, right? You're paying for your own, your own privilege to drive because driving is a privilege, not a right. You know, blah, 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 all that stuff. Anyway. When the car was broken, we'd tell our dad, hey, you need to fix this on the car. So one day I'm driving and I noticed the ABS didn't click in. So like, or it clicked in, sorry. So I'm driving down like a normal dry paved street and all of a sudden the ABS kicks in when I go to put on the brakes and the car basically ABS releases your brakes, right? That's what it does. So wait, if you're ever driving in a car with ABS, you'll be driving and all of a sudden it kind of like feels like, it's not like it doesn't feel, it sounds like a clunking sound. It's like tick, 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 and it's your brakes releasing where essentially your car can't brake. And the reason why is if you're slipping and your brakes lock up, they want to release your brakes to give your tires the ability to keep rotating and keep traction on the road, right? Kind of, you know, pretty pretty simple stuff. Anyway. Anti-lock brake, yes. Anti-lock <laughs> brakes, yes. Prevents your brakes from locking by literally releasing them. But it also means you don't stop when your ABS is on. It, it takes a lot longer for your car to stop because it's releasing the brakes every so often, right? So I tell my dad the ABS doesn't work. It's it's it activated on dry pavement. He's like, okay, whatever. And then you know, he, it's it's fine. It, it, some time goes by. He goes and drives the car once. He's like, oh, I didn't feel it. So you must be crazy. You're smoking something. And I was like, okay, fine, whatever. And then when I grew up, I had a shed. Okay, we're getting to the shed part. I had a shed at the end of the driveway. So we had this driveway, and you had to turn like the driveway kind of turned to the left, go towards the house. But at the end of the driveway, there was a shed. And we also had an above ground pool next to the shed. And of course we had that camping trailer parked next to the shed as well. So your options were at the end of the driveway, either shed, above ground pool, or, you know, car thing, right? Of course I'm driving home, I'm coming into the driveway, right before I am about to stop the car, maybe 20 feet from the shed, what happens but the ABS fails. So all of a sudden the ABS kicks in. And I had like 30 seconds to decide where to go. And it was either hit the car into the pool, hit the car into the shed, or hit the car into the camping trailer. And that was it. Like, I wasn't, the car wasn't going to stop. So these were my three options, right? And uh, so I'm like, oh, you know what? The shed's got these double doors. I'm just going to hit the shed right center of the double doors. Hopefully it'll blow the doors open on the shed. You know, it won't, it won't mess up too much stuff, right? That's my, that's my goal. Well, that's the day I learned that 3,000 pounds of momentum is an unbelievable force. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I hit the center of the shed, and they were like, you know, those shed doors, they swiveled open, and it just blew them right off the hinge. Like, it was unbelievable. The amount of force that 3,000 pounds, even at like 10 kilometers an hour, holy cow. It was just like, gone. Doors obliterated. Like, just off the hinges, into the wall. Yeah, it was a good time. Anyway, my dad uh, comes out. He's like, what did you do? to Because the, the car is like jammed into the shed at this point. The doorway wasn't really wide enough for a car. So it's kind of like jammed in the shed doors. And he just comes out screaming. And I'm like, I told you the ABS was going to fail. And sure enough, it did. So that's what it was. Anyway, he took the car in. And yeah, the ABS uses a little gear with a photo eye. And basically, if the gear, it, it I don't know, it can somehow see that the gear is locking up or whatever or not spinning. Anyway, uh, it was just dirty and needed to be cleaned. And that was it. it got cleaned and then it never failed again. So, so I mean, I'm going to ask the question that all the audience is going to ask. Uh -huh. Did the car not have a parking brake slash emergency Well, brake? so, okay, so, see, I knew you were going to ask that, okay? I knew you, but it was a van. So the thing with, a, if you've ever dri driven a big van like that, especially a big old van, they do have an emergency brake. However, it is a foot pedal, and it is a yep. foot pedal in a very uncomfortable position. you got to, like, take your foot off the brake, like your left foot, right? And take your foot, well, I guess not really your foot on the brake because your right foot's on the brake, but you got to take your left foot and like really lift up in the seat and kind of like jam it down like in a really, it's a really uncomfortable thing to do, right? And my thought was if the car crumples because I hit something too hard, I'm going to destroy my leg if it's up there. That's uh, that's actually a reasonably fair So answer. I was like, I'm just going to just keep my feet on the pedals where they should be, right? And just, you know hope for the best because like there's no way like i could heave that on my car now like absolutely i've got the hand parking brake i would just yank that in 10 seconds right and it would, it would, that would be it that would be end of conversation this is uh this is another reason to drive manual transmission you yeah could, you just uh, put it in gear shift. just put yeah. it in first gear and it'll just scream to a halt i used to i used to love that whenever you're driving in a neighborhood and you see those things that says um please no engine brakes right and what they're referring to is not cars. They're referring to trucks. And trucks, trucks. have, it's called, Jake it? it's like, yeah, yeah, Jake brake. That's it. Exactly. And it's basically like backfeeding exhaust pressure into the engine to slow down the cylinders. Is my understanding of how that works in a very layman's term? I, I think so. I'm not 100%. I'm not 100% either, either, but it's something to use with, I don't know, it's something with basically the engine. But it, that's when you hear those trucks like screaming when they're coming down a hill. That's because their Jake brakes on. And it's like this, this backfed exhaust nonsense, whatever. And so that's what they're referring to, but I always loved it when you're driving through a neighborhood and you see one of those no engine brake signs and you just downshift it two gears to have your engine jump up to 5,000 RPM just to, <laughs> just just, screaming. just to be that guy who's like, yeah, get wrecked. But yeah, uh, was, I don't drive so a standard anymore. I too though. have an early driving car experience and running into a door story. Was it a shed? Was it a shed or a garage door? It was a garage door, so it wasn't a shed. It wasn't quite as exotic and uh, it's also a lot less uh, dramatic. Yeah. Um, my first car was a 2004 Volkswagen Golf. Okay. And it was just the lemon of all lemons. That I mean, that thing, it was a fun car. I enjoyed it. And I was like really privileged to oh, have here, a car. Oh, here, you can drive this. Young. I need to get Betsy, my bad. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I just saw you take over. So I was like, okay, Con's just going to run. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so I was like really pri privileged to have a car young. So, you know, it was good, but uh, it did fail like every 5,000 miles to the tune of a thousand dollars plus which is annoying nice but um volkswagen golf standard transmission the reverse is next to first you have to press yeah. down on the gear yeah. shift yeah. and then go my left 2004 and my first car 2004 it was a 2004 thing i swear to god my first car 2004 chevy optra same thing push down to go in reverse who does that who designs yep. the car with the push down reverse yeah, I much prefer the way that my Subaru does it these days, where you've got a little collar that you pull up instead. But yeah. I didn't really know, and I was new to driving and everything, and, and I didn't realize it, if you didn't it hold reverse. it down the whole w whole time, that it could pop into first. Yeah. And uh, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say hello to you at very quick speeds here. Oh, hello. Hi, friend. You got to put your probe out before you do that next time. Though, I do. I need it? to I need to put my bar up here. Yeah. Dunk. There you go. All right, Perfect. go for it. Dunk. Thank you. All right, let me let me just uh, let me just give you all of Betsy's power. Yeah. All right. Uh, you, you've got the train now, friend. Oh, okay. Perfect. It's all yours. I got it. No problem. I could probably do this too, actually. You probably can until we get uh, until we get to the grade, of course. Yeah, it's like zero percent or down the whole way, basically right? Basically flat. So. I mean, if I start pushing, I can oh, make this run it. way too fast. So yeah, that, that's true. So, this is so, actually this is actually the way to do this right now. Yeah, oh, I'm almost out Betsy of water. Uh, I'm going to stop at the thing and fill up. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm at almost 100 water now, and it's going a anyway, down. Anyway, uh, so 
Yeah, I thought I was in reverse and I was in first, and I had the Ricky Bobby Talladega Nights moment where yeah, I was staring backwards. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I punched through the garage door a little bit. I broke one panel of the door. Um, it was already a door that didn't work. Is it, is it one that, like, it's a roll up door, so it's got, like, individual panels? Yeah. And... yeah so I okay. punched out one of the panels, and I mean, I, I realized what happened right away because, yeah. you know, oopsie. But uh, yeah, that was a that was a stupid moment. <laughs> yeah, the only uh, the only other bad thing I had once is uh, which isn't really a stupid moment. I um, when I was when I had my first car, um, which I don't think this is entirely my fault. But anyway, I had my first car and I was trying to impress a girl and it was in standard. So I was like, screw it, I'm just gonna do a massive burnout because guess what, guys, it doesn't impress women. But let's pretend. Dude, uh, uh, it impresses me, and it yeah. touches my heart. So, well, there you I mean, go. So I went to do a burnout with my Optra, which is like a four-cylinder two-liter. So you just get it screaming at 6,500 Yeah, so I had it RPM, screaming at like, like 5,000 yeah. RPM, and then I go to pop the clutch, and I sheared the right drive shaft in half. Are you kidding me? No. So on your, when you have a front-wheel <laughs> drive car, there's two drive shafts. They're called, like, they're CV joints, right? So constant velocity joints. And they go, it's like, a, you know, a CV joint to a shaft to a CV joint, right? And they got these, like, you know, they're freaking... I think they're CV joints. Pretty sure, or they're, or they're universals. I'm pretty sure they're CV joints because they need. They the should be CVs in a in a. Yeah, because yeah, you need the constant car. velocity from the transmission down to the wheel. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I so I I sheared it in half, like literally sheared it in half to the point where all of a sudden, and what happens because of the differential in a car, all the power goes to the broken side because it's the side of least resistance. So all of a sudden you hear this like pop noise, and then you hear the the half of the drive shaft rattling around inside the engine compartment because it's oh, just God. free spinning now you know Making and so a nightmare of a sound I'm yeah sure. it's just like really just terrible so i turn it off instantly like turn it off there's no power going to left wheel and then i you know there's nothing you can do the car's screwed so she had she left um you know surprise surprise uh didn't didn't get the girl thank god it wasn't my future wife because like that would just be super <laughs> embarrassing a little bit. Um, yeah. So, yeah. fun fact, uh, it doesn't really impress chicks when you do a burnout, but it really does really impress does if you chicks break when you try to do a burnout <laughs> and you break the car. Yeah, so anyway, so I towed the car all this, and then, and then it was funny when I actually, when I knew the drive shaft snap because when the mechanic was like, bro, you just snapped your drive shaft, I was like, can you keep, can I keep that? Can you get me the drive shaft? So they put it, they put it in a box and they gave me the drive shaft, the old snap one. And sure enough, I had, I had sheared it. Like, it was a 45 degree shear right through the Ooh, steel. Oh, ductile fracture. Yeah. Look at You're that. You're talking a one inch piece of steel just sheared like just just twisted like the whole thing twists and it always twists believe it or not steel will always shear at about a 45 degree angle because of the way slip planes work and material science everybody loves it but yeah so it sheared right on the 45 degree and my other buddy who i was living with at the time he was also an engineer and he's like look at that a 45 degree shear on steel we're like i'm like bro shut up like, about like we six, learned this in class <laughs> about, about yeah. 600 bucks but yes it failed the same way like what a what a shocker it actually like broke at a 45 degree it was awesome uh, so that, anyway, that is so, awesome. Yeah, I didn't get the girl, but uh, yeah. So I don't now. The reason I don't think this is my fault, right, is because a couple months earlier, we were at a garage. Cosmo and I were at a garage that he was renting at the time, right? Because Cosmo was my roommate for a long, long time. So he was renting this garage, right? And I came there, and it's where he stored his, his bikes. And we, we went to the garage. And I parked. It was like in this alleyway. And I come out one night from the garage. We were there until like two in the morning. And we walk out, and uh, and we go to drive home in my car, and my car feels like wobbly once you get past 60, 60 kilometers an hour. It just was like, it was like, dude, oh, I needed water. Yeah, I was wondering where you were oh, going. Oh, yeah, I, I was I was going to get in front of the helper. I'm going to get water. Anyway, so the car felt wobbly, so I was like, what is this? Why does it feel wobbly? Turns out my rim was bent, and the rim oh. was, but we didn't know how the rim got bent, but it looked like someone backed into it. So when I was in this alleyway, it looks like someone just backed into my car, dented so the rim. So you, you fatigue loaded and fatigue stressed that drive shaft. Well, to that's hell. what. See, so that's what I think. So I think the bent rim, when someone smoked my car, actually probably put an initial bend into the drive shaft a little bit, and then when I, you know, anyway, long story short, either bent a bent drive shaft or it uh, or or fatigue stress. I mean, f fatigue yeah. stress in. Like, rotating components is a huge deal. Anyway, so. I don't think it was my fault because of the bent rim situation. I think it was whoever backed into my car caused the problem. Naturally. But. I mean, 
uh, I can tell you that I've done many clutch dump burnouts in my little Volkswagen that I had. Yeah, uh, and, it was and fine. I never broke a drive shaft. Yeah, it was a first. It was a the 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 uh, the mechanics who fixed it were blown away. They had never seen that kind of a failure before. And I was like, because it's like it was the only thing broken in the whole car. It was just drive shaft sheared in half. That was it. That is. And they were like, amazing. that's insane that you can do that. I'm like, yeah, man. My Chevy puts out power. You know what I'm saying? Like it's. Uh, <laughs> it's got that you it's did, got that big boy engine you know you didn't get the girl on that day but you did learn something about solid thank fracture god mechanics. thank god my future wife is not impressed at all by cars like thank goodness <laughs> she like she worked in automotive too just like i did that's where i met her was at one of the places i worked and she could not care less about cars she's like to her cars are four-wheeled things that move you know like that's that's it. They're all the same. There's vans, there's cars, and there's trucks. You know, like that's, that's it. There you go. <laughs> Love her to death, but oh my goodness, she is not impressed by my car skills. So it's just that's wonderful. Anyway, we're playing a train game. I thought we are playing a train game. I, we got. Uh, and speaking of uh, fracture mechanics and trains, one of the, the coolest things that I've seen in fracture mechanics was a train part. One of the fun things that you learn working for the class one is the politics and mechanical shops and uh, metrics, and people are always trying to make metrics look good, and this is true in many large companies where people are paid and given raises and, and made to look good or get yelled at based on uh, how they meet or do not meet metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, a lot of times some stuff would get highballed, as we'd call it, or pencil whipped, uh, if it was, you know, something that should have been fixed that didn't get fixed. And uh, I had a coworker who, told you know it got written up on this locomotive on its annual annual inspection and semi-annual inspection for like six times in a row let's go uh six times in a row they wrote up this coupler pin being broken oh, i got the class 48 i was just gonna get, let betsy full reg it because like, oh yeah betsy's... just leave betsy full reg and then yeah, yeah. that would be fine oh my god this is ridiculous betsy's not gonna do anything otherwise i'm losing pressure here but i'm gaining temp so it should it'll be yeah fine it should be getting close yeah, yeah. uh Okay, I thought, I thought for a second we weren't switched the right way. I was like, oh my yeah, god, we're going full for speed. for a brief second. <laughs> oh. okay, I'm going to shut off till we get to the hill because I don't want to hit it, like, get us over Fair speed. Enough. Actually, I'll, get, I'll put it in now. We're going to have to stop but, um, at the iron mine and, and break half the train, or do you want to try going for it first? Let's see how far we get, and then we can just okay. tie down the cars wherever we stop. Fair enough. That's a good point. Yeah. So, anyways, this guy, he NAs the write-up, so he says it's not applicable. There's nothing wrong with it that the coupler pin, the main pin that holds the coupler to the body of the diesel, had cracked. What? Oh what? my god, we Wait, just kicked Betsy off because of the tree. Why is the there tree a tree in the there? collision? There because wasn't, the, there wasn't the a tree tr there. Like, we literally just rode this line, like, last episode. Apparently it, uh, it was grew. there in a place where Betsy collided okay, with it. Uh, just slowly bring this back. I'll rerail Betsy up top. Here. What? The, that tree wasn't here, like, an episode ago. Uh, it's still there and it's pretty close, but the the annoying thing is that the hitbox of the winter trees is different than that of the fall trees, and I guess yeah, that's so Betsy weird, hits dude. that and we don't because Betsy is lower to the ground. Dude, that which is, is that, that we is just so corroborated weird. the uh, the whole the cylinders needed to be canted up discussion we had a couple episodes ago. The sad thing Betsy is hit. Betsy is we didn't. Betsy's still full regging it down here. <laughs> She's just making a, a Betsy snow angel. She's just doing it. Anyway, like six times in a row. So for three years, this coupler gets written off as, you know, not applicable. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And finally, uh, it gets repaired after six, you know, six times through the shop for major maintenance. Right. Uh, and the biggest piece of the coupler pin, which is like a good foot, foot and a half tall, five inch diameter, big honking thing. Uh, the biggest piece was only about four inches tall, and it was the perfect illustration of case hardening uh, a piece of steel. Because you could see for maybe, I don't know, a quarter inch, maybe, you know, I don't know, seven-ish millimeters, you could see the depth of the hardening of the steel that they did to treat it for extra hardness, where it had brittlely failed, 
but then the rest of the failure surface were ductile because he saw all the little pieces. Yeah. And it was just like like all the little peaks. So in the the, their solution really to cool. repair this coupler was just continuously case harden it over and over again? Like that was the... Well, no, so they didn't do anything to it. They just left it as it was. It was a hardened pin originally. Right. Uh, <laughs> And it was ho holding things in place, and it had wedged itself in place so that it, it still functioned, and it didn't cause the knuckle to fall out or anything. So my coworker said, oh, no, it doesn't need to be fixed, despite it obviously being very broken, and it was politics to get the release done faster, because getting the coupler out, getting the bits out and everything. Finally, when it, I mean, it was just one of the neatest little bits of material science I've ever seen, because it was like, this is fracture mechanics in action. You could see how ductile fracture works and how brittle fracture works. And yeah, it's always fascinating when material science actually works in real life. Because to be honest, I was not like material science was one of those courses that we you know had to take in engineering, and it was one of those courses that I thought was like it was cool to talk about, but really terrible to do the math on. Right. You know? And it was like it was cool, like it was it was wicked. The concepts are great. The way you can apply it in real life, fantastic. It's all very relatable. You can say, hey, this is gonna fail this way, and then you can do it, and it'll do that, and it's it, it behaves the way you would expect. But then when they're like, all right, do the math and tell me exactly at what force this will cause this to happen, I'm like, no, I'm I'm done. Like the math is so complicated. Right. But the the way it's relatable is awesome. But for me, it's yes. like, oh, I broke that pin. I'm gonna make a bigger pin, like that. You know, like that. Right. Yeah, I don't. Use the old engineering hack of make it out of really thick steel and. Yeah, work. make it thicker and bigger, and see if that works. And if it still fails, we'll do it even bigger next time. Like that's, you know. So it's, it's always a good solution. Yeah. How are we doing? <laughs> we're we're still. We, we're, we're making it. We're doing it. Oh, we gotta go to the iron mine and flip that switch. I will do that. Okay, well, I will uh, be in charge of all three of these engines still then. Yeah, no, well, we're there's no way we're making it up this 10%. The only saving grace we have is the 10% hill is short. It is very yeah. short. <laughs> that is the, the nature of, of which you would hope it is. Why yeah. is it 10%? Because it's short. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, like, I don't, I feel like we're not even going to clear the first, the first bridge. And actually, it goes 10% and then it does, oh, wait, no, that's still 10%, isn't it? I was, I thought maybe it leveled off a bit, but it doesn't. Where are you at? Coming around the corner. Uh, we are coming on the bridge oh, uh, right up? before the iron mine. I'm the guy running in the line. Just in the grade. Running in the gauge. No Run him deal. over. Uh... Just watch this. Through Betsy into the 48. What a combo. Boom. Boom. That's a move. That's a that's a wombo combo right there. All right, we're uh we're gonna hit this and we are. I'm leaving the Glenbrook because I want to get a good thumbnail shot here. Yeah, we're. I don't think we're gonna make this. I don't know. We will just have to see. It's. It's. It is moving. It is moving. I will give it that. Ten percent from the side really looks gnarly. It's just steeper than heck. Oh, we're we lost it. I told you we wouldn't clear the first bridge. Yep. As soon as the load's off, that's it. Boom, gone. Nothing. Like, we were, like, half weight right now, right? All right, we got to tie some brakes ASAP. Yep. Yep. I got a brake on. I'm leaving Glenbrook wide open. Yeah, same. And I tied the brake down. I got 48's um, I'm going to cut the train in half to start. I'm going to set all t all four of the trailing brakes. Do you think, do you think, think half is enough? you think we can do two and two? I don't think so, but I want to well, see. Hold on. The weight is... The, let's do this. Let's cut it in half by weight. Oh, that's smarter. Yeah, so so that's like probably... like the two front and one beam car, and then leave five. Yeah, that's probably closer. That to would make weight. that would make because the front ones like these loaded are nineteen thousand eight hundred, and the beams loaded are nine thousand. So it's like and two, that's that's just the beams. weight of the cargo, not yeah, it's the car itself. Yeah, it's literally actually almost in half just doing that. Class forty eight still got brakes on, so we're not gonna move. Let's see this. No brake. Dude, we're moving. Let's go. Oh, we're gonna just have we're to double going. it, dude. We're going. Oh my god. We are this moving, bro. Cool. We only have to double this hill. We are champions. We are. Okay. We are the champ. We have as many edges as we have cars. <laughs> <laughs> we but are, it works. We are truly narrow gauge we right are, now, it my works. man. <laughs> it works. This is this is truly the narrow gauge special. Uh, three engines and three cars. Three cars. This is great. Ten percent great. <laughs> Dude, dude, honestly, people are going to be like, why don't you just take one car per engine? Doesn't work that way. They have to be 
Oh, it's amazing. I love it. That is Dude, we just are, hilarious. We are slugging it. Then we'll come back for those five. It'll be great. It's perfect. This is this is dumb. This is dumb railroading right now. This Dude, is this some UNS stuff. This is the best railroading ever. <laughs> I can't believe we could actually do this and just doubling it instead of tripling the, it. The thing that's extra hilarious to me is that Betsy is literally pulling harder on this hill than the Glenbrook is. Yeah, I feel like the Glenbrook's <laughs> more dead weight at this point. Betsy and the 48 are really just... They're, they're the superstars. The 48's really the superstar here. Yeah. But it's, uh, Dude, this is God, amazing. This is I can't believe this works. <laughs> And watching all three sizes of drivers is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, all Betsy's doing different just stuff. Ah, and the 48s, okay, yeah, yeah. And Betsy's hunting, just, yep, too. We're like, going. Betsy is like, we're Betsy's just sliding all over the place trying to pull this. It's amazing. All right, so we're about to clear the hill here. Uh, as soon as we clear the hill, I'm going to cut the 48 reg to zero, because otherwise we're just going to accelerate like crazy. Yeah, I think I'm going to do the same on the Glenbrook and just let Betsy take it because it's, yeah, it's flat downhill. and then it goes 3% down, right? Yeah, it's only flat for that one little bit of, of concrete up there at the oh, top. Oh, goodness. And now we're down 3%. Uh, so Betsy's towing it. I'll get on Betsy again if I can, if it'll let me. There we go. There we go. Perfect. It's funny, too, because the front light post of the 48 makes it look like it's attached to Betsy as one, just one solid engine. <laughs> yeah, let's get some... Oh! Oh, oh Betsy! Ah, ah, oh, no, ah, Betsy! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, This is the no. biggest Kenosha moment yet! <laughs> what what happened? happened? I don't know. Was there a tree? Oh, my... Uh, I, I don't know. All I know is that the Class 48 is dangling from the bridge. Oh, my God. This is a disaster. This is a this, is, this, this is, is a. We need a clear. I think we need to cut back more trees. I feel like maybe. I don't. It doesn't look like there was a tree. I don't know. Maybe the collision. Let me the go inspect the track. Where? Oh my god! This that is, is um, this is cups for this everybody. Is tragedy. This. Is... <laughs> Lots of pee cups today. Oh, oh my goodness! What happened? We weren't even going. Even know. Were we going too fast? Like I can't. I can't I didn't imagine think we were going too fast. It, Betsy didn't sound like she was running super speed. Oh it my keeps increasing god, pitch as you what get a her. what a disaster. All right, look, we're back, Heist. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, we've we've made it. We're back. Yeah, yeah everything's the great real. Wreck so of let's... 1895. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to say uh, you know, I already saved. Never mind. We're fine. That's fine. We're good. <laughs> uh, none of the engines have brakes on right now. I just released all the brakes on the cars. You have no tender brake. Uh, I'm Excellent. just gonna let Betsy coast, cause like I don't, I don't know what, what happened. Apparently, speedy boy. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm uh, just gonna not use the, a good idea. Yeah, the class 48 to do some braking, and of course has no boiler pressure anymore. Can we? I'm just gonna give it some brake power. While we're going down here. I've got air brake. I'm the one engine with air brakes on here, so that's true. But I feel like your air brakes are nonsense. So, ooh, I see how it is. Yeah. I used I like I like the Glenbrook, but I was using it on the last run with iron, and it could not break for anything with all that all that iron. You know, I mean, maybe yeah, because the iron is too heavy. Of, we we really need to get brakes down the train line and have straight air brakes at least for the cars. That would make me so very happy. <laughs> Which was common. When did air brakes come? You've, I've asked this like a million times. Nineteen something, right? Nineteen early nineteen hundreds. Well, 1900s? so automatic air really became a thing in the early nineteen hundreds. Right. Um, straight air started to show up, kind of 1880, 1890-ish area there. Um, so, you know, it's conceivable that most of these locomotives may not have been built with air brakes, which is definitely true, and, and that's why Class 48 Betsy don't have brakes at all kind of thing, right? But, right. Um, the straight air would have been pretty early on and would make the game a heck of a lot more palatable. Uh, to operate because we are have we are on way the overshooting this. We are gonna be. Yep. Let me back up a little bit. Hold on, I got it. Yep. I tied oh, you have, the you have brakes uh, on. A cars. I have I have a couple brakes on and I've got Glenbrook's brake on. So yeah, I can't push one. through it. Apparently, that's interesting. We're shoving through it now. I got Glenbrook's brake off. All right. All right, that'll do. Perfect. Yeah. So I built this little lane. As you can see, it's not very big, um, but it's, it's big. just enough for yeah. what we need, though. It's just enough to split a train into two sets of four. I think maybe you could fit five cars on the outside lane, if you, or maybe six even. That would be, like, about as big. Um, but it gives us a chance to do the runaround, or if we're running just helpers and the train's, like, all in one, we could just... This is where we divert the helpers. All right, bring them back. All right. I'm just dragging Betsy at this point. I don't think we need to... Yeah, I don't think we need to worry about her. No. 
But yeah, this is a nice little, nice little flat section in the middle of this crazy route. That's all we got. All right, so if you're if you're triple heading like we're doing now, which is yep, really stupid. Would you bring it, back the engines connected, or you'd separate them all and let them go back? You'd individually? separate them. It's bad to go downhill with multiple engines tied together. Right. It's just, um, it's just all the pinning so, and jostling, and like if you're not perfectly connecting them, then that's it. You can also certainly derail based on the forces between them. I mean, that was the the last big derailment on the DNRGW was one engine ended up having all the slack run into it and the, the second engine being as heavy as it was shoved the tender off because the tender was considerably lighter comparatively right and then the tender ripped the the first engine off and then because the coupler was still intact between the tender and the, the second engine that shoved it then it went off and they rolled things over it, and destroyed have you ever a seen like a, a tender crumple like would it, do they ever have enough power to like literally like crumple a tender like bend it in for from sure. both ends yeah the, the tanks can get ruined sometimes. Like just so squished. Just, yeah, it's uh, not, not a good time. So uh, tenders are not, they're not super thick steel. They're usually like quarter inch uh, plate the whole way around. You ever seen a tender, so, a tender get punctured and like all the water comes flying out of it or? I've never seen that, thankfully. Uh, it's certainly happened in the past and they certainly do start to leak. But right. uh, it's kind of funny. One of the... Uh, the age-old method to stop the tender from leaking is to let it rust. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. The that, rust builds up. Rust builds up and it plugs the leaks. So it's funny. Um, 346 now has a an entirely stainless tender to make sure that you know it doesn't it survives for a long time and it doesn't wear out and everything. But uh, it's got a couple leaks that just leak because it's stainless and it doesn't rust over anymore. Yeah, but so... don't you guys use like flex tape, you know, and just. Dude, we need to get some flex tape. Dude, we need <laughs> brakes. I'm at max brakes right now. This is not enough. Okay, I've got about 60% brake on. Yeah, you're controlling us. I'm, I'm not moving off max. Betsy's at zero, but I mean, Betsy's just dead weight. But we Betsy's got... just a, a postage stamp on the front at this point. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And remember, you got to hitch to those cars that are on the slope. So we're... <laughs> right. Right. Don't and I can't see them at this yeah, moment. Approaching so slowly. it is just going to get interesting. Like they're on the bridge over the valley. Like if we eat them, they're going. They're going to fall for a long time. And I, okay. we've already peed in so many cups. I don't know. Grabbing a break. Left. You know, like grabbing a, a counter thrust. Yeah, that's how that works. Counter thrust. Yes, that's fine. Dude, this is ten percent. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Dude, this, this alignment just looks like it's out of a cartoon. I can't believe it's it works. Ridiculous. It's great. Oh, oh god, your tender like okay. came off. Uh, it's fine. We hit too quick. I'm at uh, 0% break, 100% break again. Nice. Got it. Okay, I gotta get the pin in now. Alright, get the pin in. Pin's in. Alright, I'm going kick, full speed on the Betsy. Bars forward. Yep. Full speed on Betsy, and I'm gonna put fuel in it because she's dead. Alright, perfect. Uh, we're still going backwards. I got full speed on the 48. Okay. I'm kicking brakes off. brakes off now if yep. the game lets me do that. I'm full speed on everything. Wow, we pushed back so far. I can't far. run over the beams from every angle. That's, oh, God. Uh, kind of annoying. Here we go. All right. This, we're full you speed. Can, you can run over the beams from the side, but not from the ends. Yeah, well, Okay, all the is... brakes are now off. Perfect. Is the 48 wide open? Yeah, Betsy's wide open. The 48's wide open. We might need to get a run at this. Okay. We have an extra. So, we we the only thing we didn't factor in. We divided the load weight in half, but we do have an extra car. It's true, but the cars are only like eighty eight hundred pounds. Yeah, but it's the extra friction I'm worried about. The uh, the forty eights running in reverse. Yeah, I'm pushing through Betsy's forward so oh, we can go down gotcha. to get a run of I see this. What you're doing. And actually, I I just have it off. It's not even on the reg. Now I have it off completely. All right, full speed ahead. Full reg. Just that, that, you know, that, that classic freaking 10 wheel burnout that you're doing with the triple header, you know, like just, uh, yeah, extra whistle power. Whistles help, okay? We'll make it through. Do we really have 10 wheels? Yeah, we have 10 drivers, yeah. <laughs> 10 wheel burnout. It's, uh, it's, we're, don't worry, we're running in 0406260. Cause that's, that's a thing. Fine. You sure all the brakes are off? I'm gonna just do a double check yeah, here. 
Yeah, I thought I got them all. You got your tender break tender off break too? On. Yep, tender breaks off. All right, let me just check. Yeah, zero. You're slow. Yeah, you're host. You might have a better time. Yeah, well, uh, just that. sometimes I know you can leave it like accidentally at a weird. No, oh, they're all off. That's literally just the extra friction from the cars. Wow. Oh boy. Well, we're still making it. We're still it's moving just, uh, with the run. It's slowing down though, for sure. You can feel it. It definitely is bogging. <laughs> okay, so if you had, I've always wondered about this, which I don't know. If you have sand, right, and you put sand from the front engine, will that affect all the other engines as well, or will that first engine just obliterate the sand to the point where each engine should put down its own sand? No, nah, definitely. The sand definitely carries for a surprisingly long time uh, back. Like, for us at the museum, we'll actually sand on the first time up the hill if it's a slick out or whatever. And then we don't really need to sand for the next little bit because the sand will even remain after you've run over it. Like, after you've run over and all your cars have run over it? like it's Several still... times over. Like, oh, during wow. Polar Express, we do four laps to the North Pole and two laps home. And you would sand leaving the station the first time and you may not need to sand again that whole run. So six laps over it. Wow, that's crazy. This bridge is eight and a half percent, by the way. It does level off, so we should so be So it good. levels off a smidge, so we, we've basically made it at this point. Yeah, I could smooth this bridge out to get to a nice, better interface at the top there, which I'll probably do. Just relay it a bit, and we'll... All right, so I'm going to crank Betsy off right away. Yeah, it's gonna, we don't need to mimic what we did the first yeah. time through. So Betsy's off. I'm going to get the 48 off. I'm off. Okay, and my brake's on. All right, we're good. Let's just go nice and slow. Wow, we made it, dude. We can double the hill. We didn't even need to triple it. Look at that. Uh, the math was saying we are going to have to triple it, but I wouldn't be surprised if one of the weights or something that's listed in the menu is not quite off. right with the new models or something. And, yeah. But there's all those little changes that have happened, like, oh, the tractive effort got changed by a little bit. So uh, it was ballpark, which is good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> just yeah, it's great. We actually, we actually made it. That's awesome. I'm just going down with Betsy. You forget how steep 10% is until you're going down with full brake and you realize you're still picking up speed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little steep. I need to do some MOW here, though, and cut back some of these trees. Now I'm scared. Yeah, that one tree surprise kick flipping Betsy was... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's not great. I <laughs> could have sworn it wasn't there last week, but maybe it, maybe it was and it just the other trains didn't have the same hitbox, like you were saying. Yeah, either or, it's hard to say. Yeah. All right, so when they calculate when they calculate grade on a rail, right? Yep. Is it inside rail or outside rail or middle? Uh, it's about center. Yeah, I mean, it, it's whatever you can do. Because on corners, yeah, it's going to be different, right? So. so they just assume based on the middle point that that's what the grade would be. Yeah, and it when you're talking about limited grades of like a percent or two percent or something, it... It really doesn't make that much of a difference in most applications of railroading, so much so that our tonnage calculations are not actually mathematically correct right. for super steep grades, right? Because we're making assumptions that work on railroad grades, not anything super, super not steep or super, super steep. It's crazy. It's actually further from the iron mine to the helper station than it is from the iron mine to the coal mine, it seems. Oh, God. Glenbrook is so speedy. Did you just run through the Y? I feel like you ran through the Y. Nope. It's just so fast that you can't... My dust drop failed because Glenbrook is just speediest boy. Yeah, you got it. With the Glenbrook, you got to really get used to using like 5% reg all the time. You can't just send it. And even 5% is too much most of the time. It sucks that the Glenbrook actually, has zero pulling power. No, this is still power. fine. I thought my Dutch drop was ruined, but it's actually still fine. I'll have the cars follow me onto the Y, and I'll just go around the other legs of the Y real quick. I just realized, too, technically speaking, we could take Betsy, and if we connected, like, ten Betsies, we could pull as much as a Climax up a hill, you see. Uh-oh. I don't like where your head's at, Con. That's that's that might be more cost effective than buying a climax. You see what I'm saying? Like I'm Okay. Actually it's not. It, it would probably like... if you want to actually get return on that, it would be to use class forty eights, because class forty eights aren't that much more expensive and they pull five times more than the Betsy does. Up right, to 10%. so we could have an army of class forty eights. Actually that's a good point. What is the price of a class forty eight? Because the climax is fifty six hundred pounds.
class so 48. So two class 48s makes one climax, basically. And it's almost the same for towing capacity. That's interesting. I think the climax is still the way to go. It is, because it reduces complexity and shenanigans and things. And yeah, and, and you don't have to jump between multiple engines trying to deal with all the regulators. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I agree. I'm almost at the helper station now. It's been quite the adventure. Uh, I have wide the Glenbrook. You're going to hook around the front? I'm trying not to punt my cars into orbit. That would be good. How much space did you have at the Y? Did you have enough to really... I did. I turned. No issues. It's good. It's good. Glenbrook, I was worried have, about that when any... I saw the sidings again because they're so small. Yeah. Did you have any... Uh, does the Glenbrook have any blind drivers? I don't I don't remember. I want to say the number two is. Yeah. So it can yeah, take the number those... two is blind. So I can take those tight corners then. Okay. I've got my tender brake on. I've got my air brake on. And I'm ready to modulate the speed by running the engine in reverse still too. I feel like you'll be uh, fine, just though. Just the engine going... brake was not enough. Oh, really? Yeah. The eight... Oh, wow. You are actually cooking. Oh, my God. Hey, how's it going? Hey, dude. You it, yeah. you look... It looks so steep coming down. Right? <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> ah, you are... Hey, oh, hey Con. Hey, you're man. You're fly. What's up? I'm just gonna, just gonna hop on board here. How's it going? I'll uh, throw this front brake for you here on this first car. Your cars are shaking a little bit. Better now, though. Unbelievable, dude. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's still fine. This, this alignment is ridiculous. I dude, love this, it. This is great. This is the best. This is, makes every trip an adventure, you know? Like, it's there's no way you can avoid adventures. And Oh, 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 oh. oh. Okay, so speaking, getting on the reg of it, was a bad speaking idea. Speaking of adventures. <laughs> speaking of adventures, look, all of the cars are on the ground. <laughs> Let's play Reroll re Slash. Adventure number 35. Let's do oh it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. At least you kept the engine on the track. All right, we're back. Thank goodness my OCD of having all the brake handles on the same side has definitely resided since my last Railroads episode, like my last Railroads playthrough. <laughs> you would not be doing well. And I, I that, definitely I definitely don't get bothered by the fact that the brake handles just switch sides over and over again. Like, is that, that so happens? in real Railroads, that's just, that's just a thing, brake handles, whatever side it ends up on is whatever side it ends up on. Do they have multiple brake handles per car or is it always just one? Some cars, some cars have two. One on either uh, side. But, I mean, usually it's just one. Passenger cars are usually the ones that end up having two, if any. And they're both tied into the same brake system, so if one of them's on, yeah. they're both on? Correct. Yeah. Interesting. I uh, tied your first car brake here. Yeah, I've got a uh, decent amount of locomotive brake on this time. Yeah. I'm tired of the uh, pickups so far this episode. So. Dude, th we've had catastrophic failures this episode. Like, normally this is, this we have... a big wreck. Yeah. We had a couple, like, normal wrecks. Like, one car here, one car there. But, like, this was, like, the whole train gone twice. Like, that it was insane. You know? It hasn't yeah. happened very often where it's just... These are some catastrophic... That's why 10% scares the living bejeebus out of me. Flat track <laughs> is boring. Right. Ten percent's like we're going to die. We are we are going to die, we die on like this men hill on the narrow gauge. Yeah, like, yeah, it's pretty gnarly. Definitely makes it fun. God, even on the six and a half, I'm getting shoved around by these cars. Pretty. Oh cool. yeah, they're shaking. They are. They're not. I put I put it at a hundred percent brake, and it's like okay, it stops. You know, really hard. But then you take it off, and then it just starts to run away, and it's like, okay, well, what, yeah. what brake percent is the happy one? The worst part here, too, is I have this one flat section. So it's 6.5%, and then flat, and then 6.5%, which helps going up, because it's nice to get that flat speed boost to kind of yep. pick up speed. But but going down, it sucks, because you have to, like, untie the brakes and then retie them. But we're, we're good. We'll be I okay. we're still fine. I love this helix from here. This view of that bottom circle <laughs> is just ridiculous. It's hilarious. This whole alignment, the, the mines, the mine alignments we have are yeah. ridiculous, and I love them. Yeah, this is this is, <laughs> this is actually stupid. On such a, yeah. I'd never built down in this valley before. It's exciting. It's a you know, it's a it's a an adventure. It's something. It definitely is. All right, we're doing good. We're coming down. Coming down. So I'm gonna tie another break right because I feel scared. Yeah, I brought it up to like 90% for a second there. 
Yeah, I'm just scared of having to rebuild cars that fall off the cliff is really the issue. Yeah, that's uh, it's more work. Our yeah. last rerail, knock on wood, was uh, not that bad, really, honestly. No, because we got to rerail them with the 10% hill to slide them all back together, so it's kind of nice. All right, I'm off the car brakes now completely. It's all you. I'm off the engine brake, too. I'm just coasting. All right, I'm just falling through that. everything. It's fine. Well, you know, dancing on top of the car right. is hard. Hold on, let me just get uh, this brake off. Tender brakes off. Perfect. How's your wood doing? 63%. Oh, we're laughing. We're got got laughing. plenty of fire in this thing. Got those Dura flame logs or whatever, you know, the ones that sit there and burn for hours, even when right. they're in a locomotive firebox. Yeah, it's, no, that uh, makes sense. They're magic. Okay, so if you were to throw like, 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 let's say you have, a, it, this is gonna sound terrible, but like, if you had a locomotive firebox, right? Would you? Okay. And, and it's got a strong draft. It's the door is not big enough for a human to somehow get sucked into the firebox. Like that's not. It that's, doesn't suck hard enough for that to happen, but the right. door is big enough for a human to fit because that's how you get in the firebox to do maintenance. You can you can climb in a firebox when it's when it, it's dead basically when when you've let yeah, it cool down. Yeah, and, and sometimes and you have it. to climb in when it's hot, and that sucks. And that's just the the worst thing ever. So don't Wait, do that. Wait, what? I've had to do that once before. When it's Not hot? while it was running like, or while, it was, while it had a how fire. How hot is but hot? It, the boiler had a little bit of steam, so all of the steel in the firebox was like 200. 20 degrees ish oh my God. Fahrenheit. How do you not? So it was kind of like being in an oven a little bit. It how was do you bad. not die? Like you just, <laughs> you you go in for like 10 minutes and you make sure that you're very well hydrated and you stay as low down as you can next to the grates where things are cool and then you fix what you need to fix and then you come back out and or or you do what you can do in you know maybe 10 minutes and then you send somebody else in and got yeah that sucked. That sounds that sounds actually terrible. That was one of my least favorite days I've ever had um, at the museum. And thankfully these days management has changed and wouldn't force people to do this stuff. But that's, that was stuff the railroad had to do. And, and someone basically installed the, the connections of the grates wrong when they put them in the first time in the 491. And so we had the cotter pins back out. So some of the pins fell out. So the grates could no longer rotate. And this happened like right before the big event we needed it for. And so it had already been heated up the previous day. But we noticed on the inspection the next morning, it's like, oh, the, the, those pins are missing and the grates don't shake. So we had to fix them. And the only way to fix them is to go inside. And that's yeah, terrible. That sucked. So me and me and my buddy, me and my late great friend Fred uh, went in the firebox and took, you know, 15 minute turns each in there trying to get these pins put back in and get cotter pins back in and spread. And yeah, it's, uh, it's not fun. I can't ever recommend that, but it's definitely something that's had to happen in uh in lots of railroading before that actually heard stories sounds, of that sounds boiler awful. makers doing like heavier work going into a hot fire where there's still a fire in the corner like there's coal or wood or something burning to keep the fire up and the engine just tucked away in the corner and they had to go out past it um and they wear multiple layers of clothes that are like doused in water so that you have cooling and stuff and it's just ridiculous what what you had to do sometimes to keep the railroad running yeah. Something, something OSHA. <laughs> it, it is, it is, it is kind of, it is, it is really when you think about it, the guys running trains in the open wilderness, like, you know, track in the middle of nowhere in the 1800s, they were kind of a special breed. Like, you, you, yes. you know, like, like, it's one thing to do what you guys do and run trains in the museum, and that's, like, ridiculous and wonderful, and it's amazing, and I'm sure it's a lot of work and a lot of effort. But then to take that same locomotive and go into the middle of nowhere and just be like, screw it, we're gonna, like, if we die, we die, you know? Like, if, if we break down, there is no one coming to help us. Like, it's like... That's a different breed. When yeah, you were on you the had... engine for 16 hours and you were the engineer and you yeah. had to be ready to fix anything that came up along yeah, the way. Yeah, you got to be you got to be a special kind of person to take that job. Like that's yep. that's kind of insane. And this is like before you had any sort of technology like, you know, any sort of phone or like emergency service, like, you know, the the best was getting to the next telegram office wherever the heck that was, you know, like Yeah. Yeah, we we talked about like bad stuff that's happened on the railroad in other videos of mine and the, and the three quarters of an idiot show that we do talking about like, oh, every single locomotive that the Rio Grande Southern owned got stuck in the snow 
and some guys were stuck in the snow with their engine for a week. Yeah, that's literally sounds, stuck that, yeah. out in the middle of the mountain pass, stuck in the snow, couldn't get the engines to move for an entire week. You didn't bring enough food for that, you know. You're not having a good time. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely a different breed and much more hardcore. Like that was that was a different era and a different attitude and everything. And, and uh, yeah, it's very different to what we. Well, did you didn't have a choice. I mean, you had to tame the wild west. Like that was the issue, right? Like it was. That, that's it, the thing. You yeah. know, exactly. North America is a very large place, unfortunately, and so we have large distances to travel. And like one of the things that I've always talked about with um, my fiance, which her 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 mom used to do um is is the northern uh she was northern flight nursing so it's where you you get you're basically an air ambulance for these northern communities in canada and so these are communities that don't have land access in the summer because it all gets washed out um like everything becomes marshes or lakes or or melted and right and and the only way to get to these communities is by air in the summer where you can fly and land a plane on so if you ever go look on google maps and go look at northern canadian communities really small ones you'll see every one of them has a runway and it's like this little dirt runway and that's the only way to get to them and then in the winter they do the ice road trucking thing and they bring up these truckers on roads that only exist because they're frozen completely and in the summer, Nuts. you'd never be able to drive on those roads because they'd be literally like swampland that is like wet and boggy and the truck would, you know, just wouldn't make it. Uh, so that's that's how these communities exist, like way up north. And so what she would do is she would basically, if they get an emergency call, they fly a plane to pick up a person and bring them down to a, to a southern community in Canada, like a city, for medical treatment. Um, and so that was her job. And I've always thought it would be really, really cool to go to some of these places just to, to see them. Um, some of these places way up north where the only way to get to them is plain. But like, you have to be, like you have to be able to live off the land if you live up there. Like it is it is right. a special, like there's, I, I am I am the, like if an apocalypse happened tomorrow, I'm dead. I'm sorry, but I cannot grow my own food. You know, I mean, I could, I could try to grow my own food. I don't really have space for it, you know? Like I would be dead without a grocery store. You know what I mean? And it's like, right. these guys back in those days, like, 100% like just tough as nails you know they'll eat whatever that they have to they'll make it work you know they'll go strangle a squirrel with their bare hands because that's dinner you know what I mean like it's just it's a next level of uh, definitely different thing yeah yeah I just there's no way I could ever do that I'm not I'm not I don't even want to pretend I'm tough enough to do that kind of thing yeah no lord knows I'm uh I'm nowhere near that tough either like it's just, and that's one of the things that I always try to say it's like yeah it's super cool that doing the railroad thing and we're running steam trains and we're doing the best we can to preserve the locomotives the equipment the stories and everything but the way that we get to operate them and the way that we get to interface with them is far from like a real railroad yeah your your trains get way more maintenance per running hour than i think anything else ever would pretty much yeah i mean the the railroad would have to do a lot almost everything that we'd have to do anyways like it's not like we get to keep them in super perfect pristine shape all the time just because we don't have enough people and enough funding to, to keep the engines perfect because that's the nature of doing a nonprofit. really is you got to take care of what you need to take care of and then if you get a little extra that's great but um it's definitely not something where it's a hardcore railroad uh but there are places that do that like i always think of my friends at the durango and silverton or the cumbrace and toltec where yeah it's a tourist railroad but if the trains don't run, they don't get to eat. They don't get, you know, they don't get paid. They got to run the trains. They got to keep the railroad open to make sure that people are still making their money. Right. Uh, and supporting their families and everything. And they're running steam doing it. And the are engines any... take a beating and so do the crews. You know, are, it's Are they it's still very running, different. like, they, they aren't still running operational steam trains for freight, are they? Is it all tourist stuff now or is there still... Oh, it's all tourist stuff. Uh, at least around the States, there are some places where they run freight. The, the Strasburg Railroad, famously in Pennsylvania, is pretty short railroad but they do have a freight charter and they will run freight with their steam engines to the couple industries that's so serve. crazy that that's still and there, there's a couple other you know places around in the states that do it um more interesting is actually in bosnia there's some actual built by the germans in uh you know the 1940s if you will 
Oh, that's good. That's <laughs> Built good. By those that, was, Germans. that was my favorite well, time of world history. Was the 1940s, right? 1940s, 1940s in, the, Germany. in Germany. Yeah, the, yeah they that was that was have... the, that was the best time to build steam engines. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, they needed a lot of them because they had to move a lot of stuff. Yeah, it was weird. There was, was just this, this weird thing that was happening in yeah, Germany. Yeah, so at that they time. built these yeah. engines and they designed them to only work for something like eight or ten years because you know it was like a short. Well, they were expecting need. the world would all be German by that point, and it would be like right. you know, Deutschland, yeah. Deutschland, everybody loves the Deutschland. You so, know, that would but, be, you know, yeah. 70 years later in Bosnia, it's still there's running. still a coal mine that is serviced by just those German locomotive steam engines from the, the 1940s. They probably got them for cheap. <laughs> I bet they did. <laughs> I bet they were really cheap when they bought them. Oh, oh man, that's, that's ridiculous. That is. Yeah, it's it's kind of incredible. And, and China actually had a lot of steam in service up until recently, but they sounds like they finally shut down some of the last big ops that used it, and they're finally moving on. But coal's cheap, and when you're mining a lot of coal, okay, yeah, it's easy, well, easy fuel source. Why do anything else? Why pay yeah. for diesel, and why change what works if it's working well enough, and you can throw, you know, tons of people at it because that's what your social system lets you do. So, all right, well. Back at the freight depot, another thrilling adventure. Uh, to summarize, as we might as well do this like an epi uh, an, uh, an essay, you know, those school, school papers. So to summarize, we talked about uh, cars, and uh, and some cars and transmissions and things, and b bad first car experiences, uh, and then we talked about uh, terrible derailments, and then and then we talked about uh, maintenance standards, and then and then we talked about. How Heiss and I are both little girls and would not survive in the wilderness. Um, and, and and anything else? Am I missing? Am I and missing? we capped it off with the Nazis, because why not? Oh, we, we, we finished <laughs> off with World War II Germany. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. It was, it was another great episode. <laughs> what, a, what a varied set of topics. Yeah, what Welcome a varied, to... Uh... People would say we should honestly... They're like, you guys are basically doing a podcast with trains in the background at this point. And it's kind of, it's kind of true. It's that really, is very true. It's, this, it's, is, this is just a podcast. It's really a podcast trains. with trains. So, you know, hope, hope you guys enjoyed. It's, it's Pe why People ask me, like, hey, you guys should start a podcast. And I'm like, no, th this that, is the th podcast. This is the podcast. You're, you're watching the podcast. Yeah, this is... The, the trains is nice because it gives us something to do. Like, I would be bored sitting in front of a microphone you know like that would be that would be boring the, the train right is... exactly oh, I, i'm not gonna Zuma's say there. we're on a collision course but we're on a collision course oh, the zuma just rendered in like just a little bit for me so oh, you know okay. we'll just uh, we'll just put him pilot to pilot it's the golden spike moment in the yard yeah this is Fine. perfect this is also the shortest Boom. line it doesn't even your train's not even fully well right. we'll we'll deal with that next time yeah all right <laughs> see you guys later thanks so much for watching everyone bye